Let me read to you a passage from the 11th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 47 to 54. It's the Gospel for Thursday of the 28th week of Ordinary Time. St. Luke writes, Jesus said to the experts in the law, Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill, and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who are entering. When Jesus left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. That's from Luke chapter 11 verses 47 to 54. It refers to sinful blindness. In our gospel passage that, that, I, that I've just read, our Lord charges the lawyers, and the Pharisees were among them, Luke chapter 11, verse 42 to 44, with approving of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Our Lord was saying that their action of building the tombs of the prophets killed by their forefathers was, without their realizing it, symbolic of their being at one with the deeds of your forefathers. Stephen, just before his martyrdom by stoning, refers to this tradition of rejection of the prophets. He says, Was there any prophet whom your forefathers did not persecute? In their day they put to death those who foretold the coming of the just one. Acts chapter 7 verse 52. St. Paul who at the time had approved of Stephen's stoning, also mentions this. He writes to the Thessalonians, For you, brothers, also have suffered the same things from your countrymen as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and drove us out. They displease God and oppose everyone. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14-15 to 15. These are references to a perceived motif, a received tradition. Jezebel had persecuted the prophet Elijah. In Jeremiah 26, at the end of his withering prophecy in the court of the house of the Lord, we read, the priests and the prophets arrested Jeremiah and presented him to the princes and to the people for capital punishment. But this demand was rejected. Subsequently, he suffered much. In the same chapter of the book of Jeremiah, reference is made to the prophet Uriah, the son of Shemaiah, chapter 27, verse 20 to 24, who was killed for what he prophesied. In the second book of Chronicles, chapter 24, verse 20 to 22, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, received the spirit of prophecy and prophesied before the people that God was abandoning them. At the king's order, he was stoned to death in the temple of the Lord. In the same inspired book, we are given something of a common, of a comment on the history of the reception given to the prophets. We read, Early and often did the Lord, the God of their father, fathers, send his messengers to them, for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, and scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. To second book of Chronicles, chapter 36, verse 15 to 16. Our Lord was saying that his enemies were part of this perceived tradition. The point is 
that Christ told them in no uncertain terms that they were culpably blind. They were of the same class as their forefathers, though they sanctimoniously maintained and honoured the resting places of the martyred prophets. It is this blindness which we must contemplate. This dialogue between our Lord and the Pharisees and scribes took place, as presented by Luke, in the house of a Pharisee who had invited him to dine with him. We ought not imagine our Lord as speaking in uncontrolled anger. Such is scarcely in accord with his consummate self-control and holy bearing. I imagine our Lord speaking in low tones within the room where all were reclining, reclining at table. I imagine him with face manifesting a holy peace, utterly unruffled at the formidable array of personages before him. He was master of the room and all knew it. I even imagine a slight smile as he speaks slowly and clearly, perhaps even slightly shaking his head in a semi-hopeless gaze at the blindness of his audience of Pharisees and scribes. St. John tells us in his Gospel that he knew what was in the heart of man. John chapter 2 verse 25. He knew them all, and they could not touch him unless he allowed it. He spoke with point. Woe to you Pharisees, he said in quiet and emphatic tone, striking at the heart of all. Woe also to you lawyers, he continued, turning his sovereign gaze on them. The setting was direct, even somewhat intimate in the sense that it was within a familiar setting of a formal meal. There was no public embarrassment before the populace. The Pharisee had invited him and scribes were among the guests. It would seem that the occasion included but our Lord and them. Perhaps some of our Lord's disciples were there. Our Lord used the special occasion to be unmistakably clear and he hoped that his words would penetrate the hardness of their blinded hearts. But it was to no avail. We read that when Jesus left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. Luke chapter 11, verse 47 to 54. The lesson we must take from the whole incident is that we ought to be on guard against a similar blindness and hardness of heart. Let us not say, this cannot happen to me. It probably already is happening to us to some extent. We probably already suffer from some such moral blindness. We need the grace of God and an opening to the light of the Holy Spirit. That grace of God is available to us in the Word of God and in the sacraments of the Church. Let us make it our business to obtain this grace and to remain in the state of grace all the while praying for the light of God to guide us and to keep us from a culpable error. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful.